All right. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I am so excited for this panel. We have incredible people here. Um, so welcome to Behind the Curtain, Safe Harbor, and the DOD. Um, this is about one hour long. I would like to introduce our panelists. Um, I have Amit Alazari here, Chris Johnson, John Repesi, and myself um, over at Bug Crowd. Um, I'm going to have them introduce themselves. Um, Amit, do you mind going first? Tell us a little bit about who you are. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so excited to be here with you today. Hi, everybody around the world. I'm um, joining you today from sunny California, but originally, as you might hear from the accent, from sunny Tel Aviv in Israel. Um, uh, my name is Amit. I just graduated my doctorate in the, in the studies of the law from UC Berkeley, so you can call me doctor, but please don't. I uh, teach at UC Berkeley Master in Cybersecurity Program, uh, and I recently, just this week, joined Intel as a Director of Global Cybersecurity Policy, but today I will be only sharing my own personal views uh, of my prior research, which, by the way, are not legal advice. Uh, so if you ever seen my talks, you know I have this usual disclaimer. Uh, very excited to be here today. Uh, uh, two years ago, I started working on issues around legal aspects of bug bounties and safe harbor uh, and worked closely with background on standardization of the language of bug bounties and vulnerability disclosure programs on a project uh, called Disclose.io, which you're going to hear about today. So uh, honored to be here with the esteemed uh, panelists and uh, let's get this party going. Chris, do you mind sharing a little bit about yourself as well? Sure. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. My name is Chris Johnson. I am the director of the Department of Defense Vulnerability Disclosure Program. Um, I am not an attorney as well, so I will not be giving any legal advice. I'm just a professional geek. Um, I uh, come from a uh, small town in New York called Jamestown, New York, home of uh, Lucille Ball. So that's, a, that's always a plus, so we can always laugh at that. Um, I spent uh, my first six years uh, in the Air Force flying uh, on an aircraft called the Airborne Warning and Control System. Um, spent a lot of time deployed overseas, uh, defending uh, other nations in our own. Um, afterwards, I spent uh, 14 years, really, uh, throughout the federal government and private industry, uh, ranging from uh, running uh, uh, network operations for the Army, uh, Pacific engineering uh, uh, throughout that theater, uh, mainly focused within South Korea. Um, uh, really everywhere, Iraq, uh, Arizona, and then uh, with a small company out of Ashburn, Virginia called Telos Corporation as a senior wireless engineer. Uh, currently have a uh, bachelor's degree in IT program management and then a master's in IT information assurance and security. Um, so uh, just really glad to be here and to talk to you guys about, uh, about the DOD and our program. Excellent. Thanks, Chris. John, do you mind telling a little about yourself as well? Sure. Uh, my name is John Rapisi. I live in the great state of New Jersey, uh, same place as Bruce Springsteen, uh, minus the race cars. Um, currently, um, a contract mission lead on the VDP program, um, working with uh, Chris uh, to um, uh, work these uh, bug bounties and, and vulnerability uh, pro um, stuff. Ah, pardon me. Sorry. I've got something going on in the other room. Um, so, uh, my background is I've worked with, well, I guess I've been with Lockheed for about 18 years now, working a variety of uh, different tasking in cybersecurity and integration um, between strategic battle command, tactical battle command, and things like that, supporting the U.S. Army. Um, and before that, um, my background in, in education is mostly in applied physics. So interesting jump from that to what I'm currently doing. Excellent. Thanks, you guys. It's such a pleasure to have you, and I'm so thankful to have you on this panel. I know our secure researchers are very excited about this panel. Um, if any of you guys don't know, my name is Chloe Musagi. I work for Bug Crowd. I am the research for growth team with Sam and Haddix, um, and I'm thrilled right now. So let's first dive in here. Tell us a little bit, Chris and John, about the DOD. Like, what are you guys and what is your connection to bug bounties and vulnerability disclosures? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I, so the, the DOD obviously is an organization that's been around for quite a while. Um, the, uh, the, I would say the mission statement for the DOD is we provide military forces to deter war uh, and ensure our nation's security, both uh, home and abroad. Um, 
I think it's important to understand uh, really the the size, scope, and scale of the DoD, so you can you can start to kind of change your mind and your and your uh, mindset towards um, how large our attack surface really is. So when you look at the DoD, uh, we are about uh, 2.8 million uh, users. Uh, that's uh, active duty military personnel and uh, DoD civilians as myself. We operate across all seven continents, 160 countries, 4,800 sites. So that's huge. Well, when we really put that in perspective, just realize that we're actually America's largest employer. We're larger than Walmart and McDonald's. Um, so that's a, a significant, obviously we talk about, you know, the social engineering aspects of that, um, how the DOD looks at, uh, at, at each area of their attack surface. And, uh, and truly some of the initiatives that we have. So uh, when we, we think about the question, um, you know, what is DOD and what's our connection to bug bounties? So uh, bug bounties um, are, are definitely a, a key portion of the DOD's, uh, our initiative towards trying to get after uh, the vulnerabilities in, in our systems, uh, most of them obviously being the external facing. Uh, within, within my uh, program, we're really focused on the vulnerability disclosures. So uh, we're a little different than the bug bounties. Most of them are, are, are tremendously successful, uh, ran by uh, the uh, um, Digital uh, Defense Service, DDS. Uh, we, I know they've, we've, they've done hack the, hack the anything, hack the Air Force, hack the Marines, the Army, the Pentagon. They're in like the third version. They just finished up Hack the Air Force, and they'll continue doing that. Uh, they have a um, a lot of uh, they have a lot of events scheduled. So where we're different, though, is that you know that's a a, a limited one to four week event that uh, that they have a very targeted frame. They have very specific systems that they want to. Um, that they want to scan, uh, pen test, and and eventually secure. Uh, we are the more enduring program, so we we run 365 days a year, uh, 24 seven. So it's uh, when you think about what we're looking at, um, it's not the targeted. Um, it's more of the all encompassing across the DoD. So. Uh, uh, you know, the DOD tax surface, you know, once again, we talk about the people, but, you know, also understand that the, the DOD's attack surface, it's, we're talking 15,000 networks and over 7 million devices. I mean, it's incredible to put that into perspective and the amount of risk that's out there. So we internally, we can't do it on our own. We have uh, some fantastic folks uh, that work around the clock to secure it uh, from both the inside and outside, but we need to have the relationship. Right? We have to have the relationship outside with the researcher community, and that's where the vulnerability disclosure uh, program, or VDP, comes into place. So um, this was actually started in 2016 by the Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter. The true goal was to really follow private industries move to develop a relationship with the global white hat community. And, uh, and at the end of the day, they want to harness that amazing power of crowdsourcing. Um, as, as, and we will talk about this obviously more in the next hour, um, but it's been truly, it's been a very successful program so far. And, uh, we look at, uh, at at expanding, you know, what uh, what we do, and ultimately the value uh, to the U.S. taxpayer. I love it, um, and it totally segues into my next question, which is like, uh, how do you how do you handle vulnerability submissions? Yeah, no, that that's uh, another great question. So uh, we have. Uh, have established a an approved policy signed by the Secretary of Defense and all of the different components. Um, we have a uh, a website that that they can go to. Um, it's a uh, uh, hacker one uh, forward slash Department of Defense and and they basically you can go on sign up and if you see something you can report it within the uh, the confines of the policy. So the policy is right there. We're very much open and honest. We're very transparent. Because we want to ensure that the folks that that uh, that are out there, then they're looking at at what we have available um, to uh, to to analyze and to research and to report on. We want to make sure they're very comfortable uh, with the left and right boundaries of what we have. Uh, once again, we're the we're the first in the federal government to have a uh, an open policy like that to 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 get. Um, 
those uh, crowdsource vulnerability submissions. Um, I think that's really important that uh, we're not just doing it on our own, that it's the it's the uh, the community. So that is, is probably the easiest way to do it. Um, you can obviously you can go to uh, to our website on dc3.mil. Uh, that'll link you to all that stuff. Uh, we started a Twitter page. So all of these and we have an email address on there, too. So we have many different ways that you can reach into and ask questions and communicate with the team because uh, ultimately we're all after the same thing, right? To defend the DOD's networks. Great. Um, and maybe John, maybe you can answer a little bit about this, which is like, how long does the process usually take? Um, and how does it work internally when taking any sort of actions? Sure. So, um, oftentimes like, you know, uh, when a researchers submit, um, team, team at the office, uh, we, we uh, work through those pretty quickly. So like the initial triage within a few hours to maybe 24 hours, depending on the complexity of the uh, validation, we, we do have to validate these reports when we receive them. Um, after that, uh, because the, the size and complexity of DOD, uh, the actual turnaround time for fix or revalidation of that fix could take anywhere between a few weeks to a few months, depending on scale, size and uh, uh, what is actually being um, uh, affected by this vulnerability. Okay, great. Um, and then just roughly, do you guys happen to know like how many vulnerabilities have been processed since starting the program? Yeah, so once again, I would talk about uh, the successes and I'm really, I'm really proud to share uh, what we've been able to do in the 26 months uh, that we started. Understanding that, uh, that really when this thing kicked off um, on the, the 21st of October of 2016, we're only given 30 days to start it. So that from anyone that's ever started anything is a, is a pretty big monumental shift um, because there's a lot of obviously because of the complexity and the size of the DOD, there's a lot of uh, moving parts, some cogs and things that we have to take into consideration like the resourcing and the structure. Um, so we're a, we're a process and a policy driven organization. So the, the policy started. So when we talk about when we first started, so as of yesterday, when I, when I pulled the latest statistics, we're actually at over 8,600 vulnerabilities submitted since, uh, since, since November, um, which is, is pretty phenomenal uh, considering uh, uh, we haven't spent a dollar really as far as on the, uh, on, on the, on the bounty side, right? So um, people can come in, and, and we are kind of the, we call the you know, a breeding or a training ground for folks to, to come in, to hone their skills and to take that next level, right, to a, a paid bug bounty program. So um, out of 8,600 vulnerabilities, uh, really when we look at it, about 69% of those vulnerabilities are actionable, meaning that they are, are truly legitimate. They're something that, uh, that my team has uh, verified. Uh, we've worked with uh, the researcher and the system owner to uh, to, to verify the uh, um, the severity of it. So uh, internal to that 69%, because I'm all about, I like uh, quantifiable data, right? So, and, and most of the folks I'm guessing on the line really want to know numbers. So out of those, out of that 69% that are actionable, um, we're looking at uh, around 13% that are actually what we consider significant. That's a, a medium, a high or a critical vulnerability. Now, there are many ways to differentiate uh, uh, between a medium and critical and high. Uh, the, the criticals obviously are the absolute worst. It's an open door. People can come in and they can, uh, they can manipulate the system. Uh, they can do some severe damage to uh, both the data on it and potentially, you know, uh, our national security. So, uh, so, so we've, we found about 78 criticals in that about 26 months, 78 that uh, were an open door. So very glad to obviously to close those fantastic that the the uh, the researchers are working hard with us 210 of those uh, uh, vulnerabilities they're considered high which means that um, um, they can they can certainly walk in the door um, but they couldn't really uh, jump through and do lateral movements across the system so they could get in and exploit but certainly it could they could turn into critical and then about 818 mediums which is a little bit less than than a high it means the doors slightly open takes a little bit more work to get in there and uh, and uh, and like I said you know 13 percent significant uh, 56 percent 
percent of that six and a half percent is actually uh, are, are what we consider low. So those are, uh oh, we have a power outage. That is now it's it's the sensor. <laughs> wave your arms. You'll get <laughs> just, but I have to stand up sometimes do jumping jacks. But keep going. Sorry. All right. It's going to make for a really interesting uh, thing to see you jump a jacks in the back. But thanks. Um, <laughs> So 56% uh, of all the vulnerabilities that we've had, uh, we consider low, which are, um, they are uh, a misconfiguration, uh, something that, uh, you know, may not, uh, may not uh, be truly critical to the system or the data that sits uh, within it and behind it. Um, but certainly they're actionable, something that we take forward and we move to the system owner. Overall, 31% of the vulnerabilities that we get, uh, we consider as, uh, as, uh, as informational, uh, duplicates, out of scope. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit, but just know that you know currently our policy is designed to, to only look at the forward-facing DOD websites. So when it comes to things like blue coats and firewalls and load balancers and traffic shapers, any of those things are kind of out of scope right now for our policy. And then of course, spam. We get very little spam because uh, we do a, a a tremendous job communicating with the researchers and with our policy that's out there for everyone to see. They know those left and right boundaries, so they know, okay, I'm not going to submit spam. Um, I will tell you uh, another another great thing that's come out, we've actually received uh, through our channels around uh, five zero-day vulnerabilities. So these were unknown prior to coming to our door, and, uh, and that's fantastic, and we obviously take those in and process them um, uh, with the system owner's help. And, uh, and then we coordinate with the proper agencies uh, to get those highlighted. Um, so, you know, when you look at, like I said, out of the 8,600 vulnerabilities, almost 70% of those are, are, are true vulnerabilities are able to be actioned, which is a, a, a pretty significant number when you think about uh, um, uh, the, the amount of reporting and also how many of those holes, right? How many of those holes were actually, were actually mitigated and patched? Um, it's, it's, it's really, kind of brought to the forefront, hey, these are things, um, these are things that we haven't gotten after before, things that the automated systems are missing, that people are missing, and, and that the red teams that go out there that are actually going and doing the penetration tests, even they miss them. Um, so we truly fill in that, that special gap in the middle, which is, uh, which is harnessing the power of crowdsourcing, which I, I don't think that, uh, you know, I, I don't think that uh, it should be understated. Exactly. I mean, I mean, it, the crowd has helped so much for you guys, and it, the numbers I'm hearing since 2016 is absolutely fantastic. Um, and I love to hear about this. Um, I mean, I remember um, your first time I met you. You were giving a talk about uh, basically about like the CFA um, extortion, also about safe harbor, um, and. I, I just have to ask, like, tell us a little bit about, you know, Safe Harbor. How did you get so passionate about it? I know this was your research. This was like your baby uh, when you were at UC Berkeley. Uh, how did you get involved? Yeah, and it's important to recognize also that the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity at UC Berkeley um, funded this research as well. Um, so the true story is I come from a terms of use and intellectual property background. My whole dissertation is around contracts. And from my sister, Karen Elazari, who has the brilliant TED talk about hackers as the immune system of the internet. You, you should check it out. She's right here, of course, in Israel, listening to me right now. I came exposed to bug bounties, um, and um, I needed a desk project for a course for Chris Sufnagel. I decided to take the first look into the contracts of bug bounties and vulnerability disclosure programs. At the time, it was literally you know, one of the first um, research projects into this landscape. I discovered an interesting thing. Um, Although the hacking landscape uh, in the United States and in general really relies on this notion of authorization. You have to have authorization to test the system. If you exceed the authorization, if you do something, you circumvent measures that protect the, the, the software as copyrighted uh, protected code beyond authorization without consent, that in, cer in certain circumstances, you might 
find yourself in criminal and civil liability. We're going to talk about that a little bit more uh, if we have time. But the point is, although this whole kind of complex legal regime is vague but relies on authorization, when I took a look at the bug bounty and you know vulnerability disclosure program terms, I found that the legal part of the programs, as opposed to the technical part, wasn't as fleshed out, wasn't wasn't outlined. There were some paradoxical terms that might put researchers at risk. Uh, so I'm talking about, this is almost two years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, two, uh, basically inspired by Karen, uh, I decided to, to not just write the paper, the paper is out there and, and you can check it out. It's already, it's accessible to all uh, on SSRN, uh, but also to try to basically affect change, do some real impact. And I went to DEF CON and I went to B-Sides and I, you know, I used, I through Karen and through connections and through Twitter, I said, you know, Sam, you got to be in my talk. And Hakuwan, you got to be in my talk because I have something really important to tell you. Uh, and, you know, this is 2017. I'm starting to do work on this. Since then, I've done around 14 conferences. And I worked with closely with the platforms and background. You did an amazing work with Disclose.io. And the idea was we need a standard for the legalese, for the landscape. Uh, that really is uh, is geared towards getting that authorization, getting those legal protections for the researchers, because that's what you would usually find in a pen test contract. Because these are take it or leave it contracts, we sometimes we don't see them in bug bounty terms. But the idea is like open source licenses, we can create one standard that will also benefit the corporation and the researcher. So that's the safe harbor safe harbor initiative. Um, research that I, I have done uh, as part of UC Berkeley. Uh, and I'm proud to say that it's now, uh, it's evolved. I was able to work with Tesla and with, with Backcrowd, with HackerOne, with Dropbox, who were the first kind of to take the lead in this, in this uh, landscape and change their policy to introduce safe harbors, to introduce protections. Uh, so when uh, Chris mentions the bug bounty policy or the vulnerability disclosure program policy, and it's important to distinguish between them, my focus was the legal part because I recognize that we do have uh, important rules and important laws uh, at place that are, you know, geared towards protecting important interests, but they might cause uncertainty and they're all focused on this notion of authorization. So that's in a nutshell, uh, the initiative that it's, it's been going for a while and it's been developing very nicely. And um, I'm very thankful for background involvement in this landscape. Uh -huh. Oh, thanks, Emmy. Hi, Karen, if you're watching, <laughs> give it a shout out. Um, okay, um, I'm glad that we talked a little bit about Safe Harbor, um, and I'm curious now, how is DOD protecting, in a sense, um, when it comes to their policy on safe harboring? So I guess I'll take that. I'm like, once again, not a lawyer. So please don't, uh, yeah, please don't no problem. bring me up for it. Um, but I will say that if you look at uh, where we've been over the 26 months that we've uh, started VDP, uh, we have, we out of the 8,600 reports that we've processed, we've had zero incidents, right? So I want to highlight that you know, as Meet talked about, you know, it, it's important to have that sound policy. So your researchers know their left and right boundaries and how they report. So uh, um, I think that the, the wording, the wording, although lawyers were involved, it is not a very, we don't have a lot of legal jargon in the policy. If you read it, it's very clear what you can and can't submit. That is important. That's important because having zero issues um, is something, and I think that's a win. This is a success and something to highlight. The only problem that we actually had over these 26 months is we had a researcher that was actually trying to en social engineer us. So that was one of our researchers that tried to, to, to get out of something. But as far as the, the reportable stuff, things that, uh, that, that the Department of Justice would ever be involved in, we're at zero. Um, if there were an issue, right, well, we'll just, we'll play, you know, we'll play devil's advocate and say that the, the researcher um, um, was absolutely within the lines of our policy. And they were doing exactly what they said they were going to do to keep our network safe. If there was ever a problem, um, that's where we come over the top and we communicate with Department of Justice and ensure that they know that this researcher, this researcher was operating within uh, a, a, a DOD established program. Mm -hmm. So that means that we kind of, we, we, 
you know, our, our goal is to negotiate that and to keep them away from um, what could be considered any type of, uh, of movement for the Department of Justice. Once again, we've had no problems, 26 months. I don't expect there to be problems. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the DOJ is, they've actually bought off on this policy. So they are very well aware of that. Um, so it's been, a, it's been on all sides, both uh, within the department, within uh, the Department of Justice, and then within the community, very transparent. Everyone knows how we operate, and and it's resulted in no problems. Great. Um, since you did bring up like about submitting vulnerabilities and like language and how to go about it, what advice would you have of security researchers when they submit vulnerabilities and how to contact to let someone know? That's a good question. I want to give this one to John because John, out of those 8,600 vulnerabilities, he has probably touched, I don't know, probably 8,600 vulnerabilities. Um, he's, he's the man, so he can tell you the, 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 the right way to do it and the wrong way to do it. Go, John. I'm curious. Sure. So it's, not, it's no long answer on this one. It's like basically like good communication with us through the platform we use, HackerOne. I know it's one of your competitors and all of that, but um, bottom line is like communicate with us um, through the platform and uh, we'll, we'll do the best we can. Things that fall outside of our purview that aren't DOD assets, best path to go is to go to US CERT. They have their own website and you could actually submit through them if you found something um, like on a US uh, uh, you know, a .gov site, uh, they could definitely take care of that. Hmm. Great. Um, okay. hey, 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 Chloe, this is Chris. I, I want to highlight one other thing, too, on that point. So right. absolutely go through the U.S. cert, but just know that if you submit a vulnerability um, through VDP, um, we are, are, are the advocates for both the researcher and for the system owner. So we will actually take those vulnerabilities in-house, even though it's outside of scope, and we will try our best to get that over. So we've had, we've had everything from uh, NATO uh, website vulnerabilities. We've had things come in for the Department of Homeland Security. You name it. We've, and, and we've seen things out of, uh, out of appliances as well, blue coats, um, and, and you name it. So although it's outside of scope, we will take that vulnerability. Typically, we kind of close it and then let the researcher know, hey, this is out of scope. But we absolutely take that and move it forward because um, as a taxpayer myself, I want to make sure that I'm getting the most return on investment of this program. So just know that because this channel is open, that we don't sit on things because vulnerabilities, uh, the vulnerability management is only as good as how fast you can mitigate, right? So we, right. Take, so we take those forward and we move them, um, even though they're outside of our scope. Um, because we truly do, con uh, we're concerned and we care about the security of the Department of Defense websites. I love it. Um, overall, I could just say so far on this panel, it really seems like communication is definitely one of those key elements when submitting vulnerabilities and moving forward. Um, and I really like to hear that the DOD is like keeps up in tabs with the researcher once they submit, like, hey, this is what's going on. So keeping them updated is so important. They love that the most. Um, so out of curiosity now, which is, I do know like DOD is definitely leading movements and having better terms than the private sector actually, um, when it comes to policies on legal protections. And I'm curious of how, how is that happening? And like, what are you guys seeing in the future as well? So I, I can share a little bit of light about okay. that. Um, um, it's really important to recognize this, that in fact, when I started my research, uh, look, you know, the first sample, DOD had the best terms. Uh, so interestingly, uh, although it was 2016, uh, because DOD worked, I assume, with you, and as mentioned, with DOJ, and recognized the fact that we, you are now asking researchers to directly report vulnerabilities if it's under your VDP, you know, without compensation at all. So taking, assuming a little bit of risk, right? Um, and literally bringing them proof of concept under the, under, or evidence under the relevant laws, the CFAA, the DMCA, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, probably want to establish some kind of a legal incentive or some kind of policy at place. So. At the time, I'm talking 2016, they already had what we call a partial safe harbor, 
saying that if you follow the careful guidelines of the rules, so that's why I always really kind of really stress out for the researcher community that these are not your usual terms of use, which you should, should read, but not everybody reads. I, you know, the empirics is about 1% and I understand that. Bug bounty terms you should carefully read. There are rules about disclosure, there are rules about scope. This is critical and it's beyond just the issues of the payment or, or the boundaries of the program, right? So they established this partial safe harbor saying that if you follow the, 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 the letter of the policy, if you follow the, gui the, the guidelines, we will not, we will not uh, recommend you for, for law enforcement, right? So, uh, Actually, uh, this inspired, I think, or I assume to some extent, the DOJ framework, which is a key document. It's only a seven-page document, so I, I recommend you would you at least you know get some exposure to it. In which the Department of Justice, basically the Computer Law, um, the Computer Law Division, outlines some of the considerations around bug bounties and VDP. And guess what? Safe Harbor is right there on page five. So really. Um, really tremendous, tremendous appreciation towards the DOD for leading this kind of initiative that I, I assume also inspired the DOJ framework, which is a recommendation, but a really important document for all the lawyers and for everybody in this field to, to, kind, of, um, to kind of get exposure to, uh, because that has enabled to some extent what we now see, which is tremendous growth in Safe Harbor and a lot of uh, programs basically adopting partial and, uh, and complete Safe Harbor, complete authorization under the relevant laws if you follow you follow the program guidelines i love this uh, we're totally going to be diving more into the safe harbor thing because it's like my passion um but um before we go into that i'm curious about what are some like the new trends and lessons that we can learn from the u.s computer fraud and abuse act also known as cfaa um, especially when it comes to extortions and the recent indictment so what should we know about it? What are some yeah. terms? Absolutely. Um, so, uh, you know, the CFAA is, is a complex law that you, you should you can read about it. And again, this is my person own personal views uh, of my prior research and not legal advice, uh, although I am a lawyer by training. Uh, um, uh, but not your lawyer. <laughs> um, the CFA um, is, uh, there is a lot of case law. There is a lot of case law around what is authorization and what is exceeding authorization. Uh, but we also have seen uh, what I think is one of the first, at least, um, you know, publicly known, we already have information about bug bounty cases coming from the CFAA. And that's, uh, and that's reported, according to reports, uh, it involves uh, Linda, a subsidiary of LinkedIn. And essentially what happened there is uh, two hackers were indicted. They were indicted. Uh, we are at that stage uh, for extortion and conspiracy under the CFAA. And it involved to some extent a bug bounty because according to the reports and the indictment, what we had there is basically an exchange, an email coming for the VDP saying, uh, well, listen, we found something big. Um, gotta tell you, it doesn't look good. We have there, so this is, if you open up the indictment, you will definitely see uh, the all the information and uh, the actual correspondence. And essentially, the, the hackers told the corporation, we found something, it's not looking good, this is what we have, we have data, we have passwords, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, before we communicate this, we you should know we are expecting a very big payment. Not going into all of the details, uh, sufficient to say that this correspondence has led to indictment under the CFAA. Right. So this is a very key uh, kind of uh, message for the community, which is we must differentiate between extortion and a bug bounty or a VDP. Uh, if a researcher, and, and, and again, uh, and I, here I really kind of recommend listening to all of Leonard Bailey's talks. Uh, uh, he's a special consultant to the Department of Justice and has a lot of experience in this. And there, there are talks online where you can find more information about this. The idea is that if you download the data, essentially you are breaking the minimization clause that we often see in bug bounties or in BDPs talking about. Once you see user's data, once you escalate it, you got to gut level, we, you shouldn't get there. And once you got there, you got to stop right there. And once you don't want, download the bulk of data, it's really hard to make, to differentiate between the good guys and the, and, and the bad guys. 
uh, and especially if you are making demands, right? So because bug bounties are about incentivizing the research community uh, to disclose vulnerabilities under agreed, agreed upon terms, which is the policy, again, and vulnerability disclosure uh, uh, policies, which are key and they're important. And by the way, this is something that the FTC also talks about. Uh, vulnerability disclosure program are about a channel of communication, that if you found something, you now have a way to communicate that and responsibly disclose that to organization. Uh, this is even about making demands or extortion. Uh, we can talk about, you know, what should be the norms in this community or the norms or the best practices, but we must, you know, make sure that we differentiate the both if, if we want this economy to work. So uh, this is one indictment that I think, you know, the community should be carefully looking at. And uh, again, and educate, I, I really kind of recommend to everybody, you want to, you have the technical part all sorted out. You probably want to also know, you know, what is the main landscape that is governing your core profession. Yeah, I love that. Thanks. Um, what can we expect in the future um, with the federal government when it comes to reporting vulnerabilities? Yeah, so that's a, it's a good question. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, right now, obviously, uh, the policy is set uh, in stone. Um, it's, it's open for, for all DOD websites. Um, I think the future, I think that, uh, that uh, within, obviously, I, I can't speak for all of the federal government, right? Because that's just too, too darn big. But um, <laughs> within the DOD, I think that there, there is a increasing appetite. Um, we want to stay uh, ahead of our adversaries, right? It's all about having that competitive edge. Um, and cyberspace, um, you know, is, is truly that's the next generation uh, battlefield, right? So you, you, when you think about the DOD and you think of what's on the back side of these networks, these are war fighting systems in a lot of cases, right? These are, are, are truly life and death. These are, are systems that we use to deter the bad guys. So I think that what you'll start to see, I think you, you may start to see a, uh, an expansion of the policy uh, to open the doors because right now it is limited. I think it was, this was a, a, a initial pilot that started off, but if you look at the language within uh, the Secretary of Defense memo, um, it was very clear that, that it's something that, that we look at in the DOD to mature and, and ultimately, hopefully, to expand out beyond just websites because that's a small portion. Like I said, 7 million connected devices online. Uh, the websites are a very small portion of uh, what you guys could, uh, and, and by you guys, I mean the researchers, what they can see and report on. And I, I think we, there's, a, uh, there's an appetite for more. Nice. Um, now, curious on here, what are some trends that you're seeing in, um, in bug bounty? Uh, sure, I could take that one, I guess. Um, uh, so I just, from our perspective, I mean, what we're seeing, um, I mean, from a VDP perspective is uh, we're getting more and more um, things through Shodan, more mobile application um, uh, vulnerabilities, misconfigurations and things like that. Um, not a huge percentage of what we see on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's starting to grow. Definitely. Um, I do know that like right now there is another trend kind of developing, which is third party testing. Um, I mean, did you want to, can you talk a little bit about third party testing? Yeah. Um, so essentially uh, this goes back to the issue of in scope, out of scope that by the way also connects to the, to the notion of safe harbor. Because if, if you're running a vulnerability disclosure program and if you don't have a defined scope, it's really hard to just, you know, authorize access to the whole world and give and give you know complete uh, legal protections for the simple fact that the basic you know the basic thing to do for a corporation is establish what do i have legal rights in that i can actually invite the community to test and if i need the community to test uh, additional additional components how do i obtain those that legal rights through contracts with the with the relevant uh, uh, parties in the supply chain. Uh, what we are seeing now is growth of bug bounty to also, uh, to some extent, encompass um, a lot of third-party components that are embedded in or are interaction in interaction uh, with with kind of the main program manager. So that goes again to the question of you know out of scope, in scope, and and that will require um, that will require legal. Uh, legal protections at place that will probably mostly be B2B, business to business. Uh, so we might see some something change, changing there. 
Um, and you know, another trend that we're seeing, and, and this of course, by the way, gives us additional insight because now we're using the bug bounty to assess the security postures of our vendors or, or you know, other people outside the organization. So it's interesting, but it requires a lot of uh, planning, of course, and you know, you have to have your back end prepared for that, but also legal protections is something for the researchers to be mindful as well. Um, another interesting part is, it's at least on the safe harbor landscape, is that we have seen Tesla not just introducing a safe harbor, but also giving, um, researchers if they follow their pre-approved researchers working on the bug bounty and following the guidelines again mm -hmm. um, um, basically giving them uh, some kind of protection from warranty limitations saying if you test our, our car uh, in compliance with the bug bounty you are a pre-approved researcher we will not deem your testing as violating the warranty limitations and that's that's that could be interesting to see how that will develop when it comes to um, expensive products, uh, embedded embedded uh, security testing, uh, and we'll see how this will work out. Uh, but definitely, congratulations for them for taking this. And, and I'm proud to say that this is how I got my first Mac Bounty coin, by the way, by through working uh, with with the Tesla team. Um, I think it, it will it will cause some kind of uh, additional shift in in the legalese as well. Nice. Um, any other safe harbor trends that, uh, for example, that maybe the DOD has seen? Yeah, that's a it's a it's a very interesting topic of of kind of uh, what we're seeing. So I will I will kind of pile on to uh, Amit's point, and I will tell you that I know uh, specifically in the DoD uh, we have what's called the Defense Industrial Base, the DIB, and the the DIB is not because obviously you know the, the DoD we don't really make a lot of stuff, right? We're here for protection, so we rely on a a host of of contractors and vendors and suppliers. That entire line, right, that we call supply chain management um, is at risk because even though we can protect ourselves in the DOD, um, we don't have those, uh, we don't have the ability to provide safe harbor for folks going after a, a, a corporation or somebody that wants to submit. So. I think that's a that's also one of those key areas, and and if you just you know you look on uh, some of the latest talks coming out of the Pentagon, um, uh, there is there's concern for that side of it. Um, how do how, how does the DoD how do we provide um, a, a safe operating space to develop, uh, deploy, operate, maintain, and lifecycle um, our networks, and then also the uh, the the uh, the weapon systems on the back side. So obviously it's a concern. I think that's going to be a trend that we'll see uh, moving forward is how do we supply, how do we supply the company that, that makes the, that, that, that produces the steel that makes the bolt that eventually makes its way onto an aircraft um, and protect those plans um, comprehensively and within a unity of effort. I think it's good. It's a fascinating thing and, and maybe something I'll, I'll, uh, I'll work, uh, I'll work on in my next uh, master's degree for my thesis. Love it. Uh, John, any other trends that you want to add on to? No, I got to say everybody's pretty much covered it all. I, I have nothing to add. Excellent. Great. Um, well, speaking a little bit more about Safe Harbor, and I mean, feel free to like jump in anytime. Um, but, you know, we just, we have Disclose IO um, over here. Uh, Casey had this idea long, long time ago, and he decided to make it go forward. Um, back in 2016, he was like, we got to do an, an open source vulnerability standardized disclosure project, um, which at the time didn't really have too much attention, and it wasn't even being addressed. But I mean, you were actually on top of this, and which is fascinating because I mean, Casey connected with you and along with Dropbox, um, which is fantastic because we wouldn't be here without your assistance, of course. Yeah, so uh, Casey worked on it, uh, I mean, I guess well before I started my research and, you know, after, and I, I was not aware, I started my work uh, on this topic and, you know, uh, and with, with, you know, with how things uh, changed in the community, it, we, uh, you know, I, I, you took, you know, the lead on, on basically re-inspiring re, uh, this initiative of, of Disclose I.O., uh, which is essentially a synthesization project. Um, 
the idea is, you know, we have one set of contract and as a platform you have, uh, although this is of course nothing associated with one platform, but again, th the idea is many program managers are, are of course looking at what, you know, what's going around on the platform, what's the default language for the platform, which background also changed to include Safe Harbor, uh, and also Hacker One, uh, which was a big, big shift for, bug, for the Safe Harbor initiative. It actually caused major adoption in the market. Uh, and the idea behind Disclose.io is you have that language, but what's new and what's really exciting and kind of following what I worked in my paper two, two years ago uh, is this idea is that not only we're going to have a safe harbor, but also we're going to have a disclosure mechanism that will allow researchers to basically look for those specific programs that have more robust legal protections. And by virtue of basically having that simplified, you know, filter on literally a button, mm -hmm. we create what I called a race to the top because we have a reputational mechanism. So until and I'm talking about the empirical landscape, we know from data that until around 2016, the legal protection, at least on, on data coming from HackerOne with around 70 programs, the legal protection component of the, of the policy didn't affect the quality of the vulnerabilities coming in in the bug bounty. I'm talking about bug, bug, bug bounties only. Uh, but this is data from January 2016. A lot has changed. Then at, Back then we talked about only partial safe harbors and only 17 programs around that. Um, that scale. By the way, if you're looking for the paper, that's by Min Gizau et al. Uh, you can find it on Google Scholar. It's a great paper. Uh, and essentially, uh, we know a lot has changed. And now it will be very interesting to see how that very simple mechanism of a reputational, having that reputational simplified disclosure tool that now hackers can go on background and on the program directory and just look for safe harbor just to distinguish between programs according to Safe Harbor, uh, will actually um, maybe incentivize, incentivize uh, more, more bug submissions coming to those programs. Now, it's also important to know that even though we have that filter, you should always carefully uh, look and read the terms and always uh, seek your own legal advice. Uh, because, you know, no filter in the world can, can give you, you know, what you will get from reading the actual terms. And usually they are short. Sometimes they are hyperlink contracts. You should also be mindful to the platform contract. So the platform has contracts that you accept when you sign into the, pro uh, to the platform. But bottom line, I, I truly hope uh, that uh, this type of, of, of simplified disclosure mechanism mechanism will, uh, will, you know, with the help of Disclose.io and HackerOne and background the community in general, um, will do great things for this initiative. Yeah, I love it. Um, for those who are not aware of Disclose.io, it's two parts. Uh, one is actually standardized vulnerability disclosure language. So it keeps both companies and hackers safe when disclosing. Um, the other part is the list that I mentioned. Um, this list um, is basically the directory for hackers, in a sense. Um, I mean, the list even started back in 2012 over a blog post. Um, and Casey's like, if I'm, if I'm missing any, like, submit something, let me know, and I'll add it to the list and give you recognition. We now have over 800 entries on this list, and it's growing because of the wonderful crowd. Um, and it's fantastic to see this kind of feedback loop of people taking Safe Harbor seriously, uh, which is fantastic. Um, and it's also, it's good to note that there's this bilateral Safe Harbor, there's protection for good faith hackers uh, while maintaining legal protection for programs as well from malicious ones. Um, I do know that we are close on time here, and I want to make sure that the crowd has time to ask any questions. Uh, if anyone out there has any questions for this wonderful panel, uh, feel free to uh, DM me on Twitter at Chloe Mistagi, or simply just tweet away at Bug Crowd, and I'm checking right now. So on my phone. Bear with me for one second. In the meantime, uh, hey Chloe, this is uh, yeah. this is Jason on the line. Um, I just wanted to ask our panelists um, general question, if that's cool. Go for it. Awesome, Amit. I um I had the opportunity to come to one of your lectures really recently and, and talk about the topic of uh, a vulnerability disclosure and how it affected a, a bounty hunter like myself. Um, 
And although there are a lot of companies that have moved towards safe harbor um, exclusions in their um, or safe harbor language in their bounties and their responsible disclosure programs, there are, there are still a lot of sites that I use every day uh, that uh, that don't have any specific way to report a vulnerability. And I've been on the side of um, having been a security professional, just using an e-commerce site, finding a vulnerability that was glaringly obvious um, and been in that moral dilemma of, do I report this vulnerability to uh, this private organization? Um, and I know that this doesn't have anything to do with the DOD, but it's definitely a question that is front of mind for a lot of hackers. What is What is your personal recommendation when something like that happens, I know you're not anyone's lawyer here, but you've talked about this a lot in the past. And do we report these vulnerabilities? Um, do we keep ourselves safe because the risk of, of legal action is, um, you know, is too high? Uh, is there indicators that you can suss out that maybe mean that this organization is receptive to receiving vulnerabilities, even though they don't have a policy online? What are your thoughts there? <laughs> Again, and I'm also, this is not legal advice, I'm only expressing my own personal views. Um, there are two things going around here. First, we know uh, from prior FTC cases and um, from just public, um, just pub, you know, from, from public testimonies that were uh, filed with uh, some Congress committees, that the FTC views um, not having some kind of an educated process to deal with vulnerabilities as uh, potentially unreasonable and uh, under the FTC Act. So it's not, it's, and, and just in general, it's not just good practice to have a VDP or some kind of a process to communicate with the external community research, uh, with the research community. It's also in potential violation of, of the law, of the FTC Act. And the FTC have, has gone after two companies um, in the past, there are two cases at least where that was a part of the official complaint. So it's important to recognize that it's not, uh, although we have a very, we have a vague legal landscape that is sometimes undermining security research, uh, you know, in some cases, we also have recommendations by regulators. And this, this, this kind of uh, prior cases from the FTC saying, you need to work with the external security research community to have some kind of process in place. That being said, uh, later today, EFF is gonna be talking with the community and also, also really talking about this specific point of the legal risks. Uh, EFF is an organization you should know. Uh, and uh, hopefully, you know, if you're more into, in, if you're interested in that, read about them, they provide basically free legal advice in some cases, uh, and you're gonna hear from them later today. Um, just my personal experience as an academic that reported vulnerabilities uh, through bug bounties uh, to companies, um, and it's always good to have uh, some kind of relationship with the security, with the researchers that are working on your products in terms of uh, knowing potentially trying through connections to kind of assess who is this organization, how they dealt with this kind of cases in the past. Um, and of course, there are coordinators like the CERT, there are organizations that can help you disclose. Um, and, you know, there are additional kind of paths you can take uh, to, to disclose in case the company doesn't have a VDP at place. Given that, you know, given the current, given the situation and given just the landscape of, you know, the legal anti-hacking laws, yes, you should be mindful that there are legal risks associated and you, this is something you should be consider, considering. But you should also be mindful that companies should should have a process at place and this is not, um, and this is something regulators recommend and we also have actionable kind of uh, case cases and complaints suggesting that these are the best practices so if a, or if an organization doesn't have an, any, any process in place they should potentially consider how they can improve their posture to better follow at least what we are seeing from the FTC and the recommendations of regulators so I hope that touched upon uh, a few items I think you know uh, definitely FF would have a lot to say later today and you know you can you can see and you can learn from them and ask the questions uh, for them as well. Um, uh, they certainly have a lot of experience with that. Uh, John, I have a question for you, a quick one. Um, what happens if a researcher does find something and there's no program? Um, what do you mean by or what what is meant by no program? 
Um, that is a good question. That was the cue that came in. Maybe specifically out of scope, like, um, yeah. like a submission comes in through the program and it was in good faith to offer it to you guys, but it's not a, it's not an asset that's in scope um, for you guys. I think maybe you mentioned it before that you can go through other organizations to report those things. So basically like no policy in a sense. Sure. So, um, so we, a couple of routes we go kind of ad hoc, um, you know, we, we can try to find uh, some path forward with that. Um, usually the fallback is uh, you could always like report that through us cert and they'll, uh, they'll work it through their, uh, their processes. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, we, we get a lot of unusual things that could be considered out of scope or definitely out of scope that we are able to work. Um, and we always do our best to um, try to get that done. I mean, even so far as to get things in where folks are finding stuff on in Git repos and uh, we're able to work that uh, and get like, you know, um, information disclosures removed, at, uh, pulled from Git. Um, so we, 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 we tend to be able to like work a lot of these issues. Um, and then, like I said, you know, US cert being the other uh, option if we can't. Great, thanks, John. Thank you. Um, before we wrap up, I just want to do a quick shout out to the crowd for, you know, taking their time to be in here with us today. Um, also, any companies that are watching this as well, um, eager to learn more about the researcher crowd, um, welcome. Um, and also to our fabulous panelists, thank you so much for being here. Um, before I wrap up, I just want to just throw out there that researchers and companies out there we need you um, to continue the movement of Disclose I.O. You know, check simply the latest list and send us that or anything that is missing from the list. And also share your thoughts on how we can improve on the language in the core terms of Disclose I.O. Because it takes a crowd, honestly, to continue Disclose I.O. So once again, thank you everyone for being here today. And thank you again to Amit, John, and Chris for being here. Thank you. Pleasure to have you. Hey, thank you. Hey, one one quick shout out uh, for those who want to get into DoD paid bug bounties. Um, please follow at Defense Digital. That's DDS's uh, Twitter. Um, they post all of theirs, and they have a ton of really cool, exciting stuff for this next year. Uh, if you want to get into the longstanding VDP, uh, that's at DC3 VDP, um, and uh, and we'd love to have you on board. And please. Take, uh, and I'll just tag on to this, please take all available resources you can, communicate with us, let us know what you want to see, hear, and feel, because we always want to be on, on the leading edge of vulnerability disclosure. Excellent. Um, thanks for that shout out. And if anyone in the crowd has any further questions at all, feel free to DM me on Twitter or simply just tweet away um, and tag Bugcrad and myself. Thank you again. And... Good evening and good morning and good afternoon. All right, bye everyone.